Okay. I'll keep it very short today. <laughs> Make more space for my call. Honorable Sikma of the Tibetan government in inside, I'm not sitting last. Dr. Michael Van Wald van Graak. Mr. Vijay Kranti. Respected in, in the uh, National Council of Claudia Friedel, sorry, and uh, Mr. Rolf Bachi, and in the floor, respected Representative Jimmy Ritzenda, respected Secretary of the Department of Information and International Relations, Karma Chuyin Kula. And all our Tibetan and non Tibetan friends. I'd like to welcome you all in the name of Swiss Tibetan Association and all other our partner organizations who uh, are part of the organizing groups uh, of this today's panel. Uh, first <coughs> of all, I want to make a short notice. Um, please, if you take photos or videos, make it only in direction to the panel, so not in the direction to the audience. I uh, hope you understand and you will respect this rule. The Swiss Tibetan Friendship Association, as one of its main objectives, has stated already 40 years back to inform the Swiss public about the real conditions in Tibet under the communist Chinese oppression to prevent misinformation about Tibet and the Tibetan people in the media through objective statements and through events like the two panels here in Bern, which was yesterday and, tomorrow, and today in, uh, in Zurich at this place. Why such panels are important? The Western governments and media use as given the Chinese narrative of the communist Chinese propaganda that Tibet was all, has always been a part of China, or talk about Tibet as a so-called Tibet autonomous region, which uh, comprises only a part of historical Tibet. The latest uh, uh, directive of the CCP is to use Sisang instead of Tibet, and with this, the Chinese indicate a re it, uh, they indicate a reason for the occupation of Tibet. The name means Western Treasure Box. What our, are our demands to Switzerland? We want the Swiss government to accept that Tibet was never a part of China. And uh, in views uh, of, uh, of uh, sorry, on the People's Republic of China to the real situation, it should uh, just its views on the real situation of China. What this looks like in reality, we will hear uh, today from our highly competent panel guests. I would like, I would now like to hand over the microphone to Claudia Sedioli. She is a freelance communications consultant and professional practice docent at the Zurich University of Applied Science. Mrs. Sedioli will lead us through the panel uh, this evening as a moderator. Please, Mrs. Sedioli. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to our panel discussion tonight here in Zurich. And welcome to our guests. The title of this evening, I don't know if you have seen the flyer, but the title of this evening is both an assertion and a demand. The title is Tibet was never a part of China, farewell to the one China policy. With our guests here on the stage, we are exploring these two statements within this evening. Our guests bring different perspectives and different backgrounds to the table. I will introduce them to you um, in a moment. 
and ask every guest a first short question. My name, as already mentioned, is Claudia Sedioli, and um, I'm looking forward to an interesting um, evening tonight. I welcome first the Honorable Sergio of the Central Tibetan Administration, Pem Patsheri. Um, you have been Sergio since May only of this year. For two terms between 2008 and 2016, you were the Speaker of the Parliament of the Central Tibetan Administration. And I will ask you a really huge question, and will please, if you could, answer it as briefly as possible. <laughs> because yeah, China's invasion of Tibet happened 71 years ago. What future do you see for Tibet? I'll, I'll try to keep, I'll definitely keep it very short because I want uh, Michael Van Wal Prague, who is uh, here, especially for this program, uh, and he, he has uh, this book in front of him, uh, for, for which uh, I think he'll bring a lot of clarification to this topic. Uh, and also Vijay Kranti, who has come all the way from India. So, in response to your question, uh, we have to consider the, despite the fact that Tibet was an independent country, uh, we also have to consider the reality of the situation inside Tibet. Um, I tell my friends that we have the right to be free, we have the right to be independent, but at the same time, uh, considering the situation inside Tibet 20, 30 years down the line, if we are not able to go back to Tibet, even independence, forget about independence, even autonomy may not make sense because uh, Tibet was never part of China. Tibet was an independent country. That is the legal argument. But the political reality is also that Tibet today is under China and our very identity is a threat. That is why we have to consider the reality and uh, uh, make sure that the identity of the Tibetan people, its language, its culture, its way of life, and partic more particularly Tibet's environment is protected and promoted. Um, if we don't have that, then land of Tibet alone does not make a difference to the Tibetan issue. That is why we are very committed to nonviolence as a means and a negotiated solution through the middle way approach. And when we say negotiated solution, we are talking about a mutually beneficial solution both for China as a state and Tibetans as a people. And that is uh, uh, what we are committed to. And, uh, uh, based on the ground reality, in the future also we'll take recourse whenever necessary. Thank you. Thank you a lot. I hope you'll be able to talk later about uh, the chances of negotiations. Now I would like uh, to introduce to you Professor Michael von Wald. He is a professor for international law, he is a mediator and an advisor to the Tibetan government in exile. Professor von Wald is also the executive president of CREDA, an international conflict resolution organization. And he is a co-author of the new and highly acclaimed book, Tibet Brief 2020. Michael, in your new book, you explain why Tibet was never part of China. Can you tell us very briefly what you base this statement on? Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> I think uh, when we talk about history, some people think it is perhaps just academic. It's only about the past, let's talk about the future. History is central to the Sino-Tibetan conflict. It is central to the conflict because China has put it there. The only justification that the PRC gives for ruling Tibet, for being in Tibet, is that Tibet was historically a part of China. China has no other <coughs> argument for being in Tibet, has never suggested anything else, only that it is there, its legitimacy is based only on the historical argument that Tibet is part of China. And we have for years been exposed to Chinese propaganda um, on the narrative that Tibet was a part of China with all kinds of arguments about titles given to Tibetan lamas and titles given to Tibetan princes, etc. 
We have studied it together with uh, the help of some hundred scholars around the world, Tibetologists, Mongolists, Persianists, uh, Japan experts, Manchu specialists, Sinologists, etc. And we have come to the very clear conclusion that Tibet was at no time in history a part of China. And I know that may confuse some of you, because we are always talk about the Yuan dynasty uh, having had some impact in Tibet. We talk about the Qing dynasty having had an uh, 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 um, interference and quite a lot of influence in Tibet. But what we don't realize is that the way in which we look at Asian history has been mainly through Chinese eyes, through Chinese historical records, not through the Mongolian ones, not through the Tibetan ones very much, not through the Persian and the Japanese and the Russian ones. And if you look at all of those, and you balance the validity of these different historical documents, you find that the nature of the Mongol Empire was very different than how the Chinese presented. The nature of the Qing Empire was very different from the way the Chinese presented. And primarily because both these empires <coughs> These were the only two empires that had a relationship with, with Tibetan, a political relationship with the Tibetans of interdependency. These empires were not Chinese empires. They were inner Asian empires. A Mongol empire, a Manchu empire. And we tend to forget that. We tend to equate the Qing empire with China. That is because we Europeans, when we went to that empire, we came through the uh, Pacific Ocean. We, we went around the, the, the water and we arrived in Shanghai and we arrived in Guangzhou and we went to Beijing. We saw that empire from a Chinese perspective, not from the inner Asian perspective that created that empire, that ruled that empire, and that occupied the Chinese. And so the relationships that the Manchus had with the Tibetans, interdependency relationship, and that the Mongols had with the Tibetans, was kept entirely separate from, their, from the Mongol and Manchu occupation of China and subjection of the Chinese people. And that is the kind of history that um, that reveals um, the, the distinction between Tibet as a, a state, as a polity, as a, uh, its own country, um, separate from China and never united with China. That's the, very interesting. Thank the you. The country that invented the idea was the Republic of China, and that was simply adopted by the PRC. Thank you, Michael. And Vijay Kranti, he was nodding um, all the time. Um, I will bring your perspective to the table in a moment. Vijay Kranti is of Kashmir origin. He has over 50 years of experience as a journalist and as a photography, photographer. As a journalist, his main areas of specialization are Tibet, China, and Kashmir. Um, do you agree with uh, Michael Van Walt? Uh. Thank you. There is uh, hardly much to disagree with uh, Michael Van Wall. What I would like to do is add to his, what he has presented, another perspective because he spoke that the world has never bothered to understand Tibet or China uh, from uh, the other perspective, only the Chinese perspective. I will present you the number one Indian perspective and how I have seen as history. Indian perspective is, India has a 4,000 kilometer long border from Ladakh to Arunachal Pradesh, through uh, uh, Himachal Pradesh of India and uh, Uttarakhand and Nepal, Sikkim, Bhutan. And over last 
you say 50 years, 100 years, 1000 years, 2000, 3000 years, we never, never, never had along these 4000 kilometers one inch of land, one inch of park, even for a day when other side was China. It was always Tibet. Relations between India and Tibet have been throughout more cultural and economic. Indians for ages and ages went over to Tibet to Kailash Mansarovar uh, without visa, without passport. Chinese and Tibetans have been coming to India for last immemorial time to India for uh, their uh, pilgrimage to various Buddhist centers. Going for history, as a journalist, I have studied history as the whole world has seen it, you know, which cannot be challenged. If you go to 1911, 1912, at that time, China was a very, very small country. China's, whatever areas what China claims today, they were occupied by other, or it was British China, it was French China, it was German China, it was Portuguese China, it was Japanese Manchuria, it was Russian Manchuria along and Tibet, East Turkestan and Mongolia were its neighbors. So, in 1912 when Sun Yat-sen created the Republic of China, that is the first concept of China as modern world, we know it. And after that, it was Chiang Kai-shek who expanded it. In 1919, he occupied South Mongolia and it became part of China. In 1935, he occupied Manchuria and it became part of China. In 1946, they occupied East Turkestan and it became part of China. Then Mao came to power in 1949. He established People's Republic of China. Within two years, he occupied Tibet. And what we see as People's Republic of China is, it is a, an artificial country made of occupied nations and from that point of view, I think talking of one China policy is insane, is unacceptable, is rubbish. Thank you for this Indian perspective. <laughs> Let's have another perspective, totally other, because I want to introduce to you Claudia Friedel. Claudia Friedel is a national councillor for the Social Democratic Party. And Claudia Friedel is also a member um, of the parliamentary group Tibet. Um, Claudia, what are the goals um, of this parliamentary group? Yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I am glad to be here by, because I see I can a lot to, uh, learn about P Tibet this evening. Thank you. So, why it exists this parliamentary group? After the bloody suppression of the Tibetan uprising in uh, 1959, uh, Switzerland was the first European country to accept Tibetan refugees. That's why today Switzerland is the country with one of the, big, of the largest group of Tibetan ex exiles in Europe. Tibetan culture and religion have become part of our diverse society. But what are we doing in our group? We are 25 members uh, of National Council and the Council of States and we are from all political camps. We maintain dialogue with the Tibetan community in Switzerland and represents their interests in the national politics. We met us two or three times a year and discuss the problems that are going on just now. In the last 40 years, we have brought attention to the catastrophic human rights situation in Tibet with more than 70 in in initiatives and called on the Swiss government to change its uncritical, <coughs> poorly business-orientated China policy. 
So thank you. Thank you. We have a first impression of what you're doing in this group, and I think we will talk um, later about surely about the human rights situation and also about the situation of the Tibetans here in Switzerland. But now I would like to introduce to you Rolf Bechi. Rolf Bechi is an author and publisher. He um, lived on the island of Taiwan for several years. He learned Chinese there. His wife is Taiwanese. Um, Rolf, you know the region. And I would like to ask you, there is currently a lot of coverage about the People's Republic of China in Swiss and European media. There are also many and more critical media reports about China and its policies. But Tibet seems to have disappeared from the media spotlight. Why? Um, good evening. I think... The, um, one of the big problems is that the media here in Europe, especially also in Switzerland, they focus on the People's Republic of China. And in fact, there exist two Chinas. There is the People's Republic of China on the mainland, and there is the Republic of China, Taiwan. Uh, even Taiwan is in our media just doesn't exist. And for me, what the most important is why does the Swiss government and the, the Swiss politic only uh, direct uh, onto, onto the People's Republic of China, which is, a, which is a dictatorship under communist rule, and on the other side we have Taiwan, the Republic of China, which is a democracy. I lived there from 1987 to 1995, and I really saw the democratization of a country this is also very important because the Chinese government in Peking, in Beijing, always says the democracy is an idea of the West, of the Western countries, and doesn't fit for Chinese. Uh, it's, it's totally untrue because in Taiwan they have now a democracy. The, I, 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 my daily life there was um, really impressed by this democratization. My wife, Linti, worked for the GIO, the Government Information Office. She published a French journal to inform foreigners what is happening there. And Saturday, I can, I can tell a little story. Saturday, when I went to see my friends, I had to go to the center of the city. And every Saturday, there was a demonstration of some people, some party, and there were um, um, right activists, there uh, are in, 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 environmental activists, and I always had to decide if I take the bus, so I will be stuck there in, in, the, in the traffic. So I always took a taxi because the taxi drivers, they were very interested in politics and they all, always were informed that they could go through. Uh, my, I think my opinion is that the, the, the Swiss government really has to change his attitude were the two Chinas because we only uh, are directed and focused on the People's Republic, but we should have more relations, political relations, with the Republic of Taiwan, which is a democracy. Thank you. Uh, coming back to you, Professor von Wald, um, I think China has spread this narrative that. Um, Tibet has always been a part of China. It has spread this narrative in China and throughout the world. Has it really been successful with this? I mean, first in, in, in the international community? Um, thank you for the question. I think it's a very important one, yes. Um, I think the answer is, the short answer is yes. China has been immensely successful. If you talk even to specialists of China, specialists of East Asia and South Asia in the foreign ministries of uh, many countries, uh, they are not quite sure whether Tibet was part of China or not anymore. Thirty years ago they knew that Tibet was invaded and had been an independent country. Today they're not so sure anymore. Why? Because the Chinese propaganda has been affected and has not been effectively countered we have not been able to bring the real story convincingly. China has simply repeated again and again the same story 
and it stays in our minds. And I know even uh, uh, that many young Tibetans, and Tibetans even in Dharamsala, some of them know the Chinese narrative better than they know the real, the real history of Tibet. Because that's what we're all being exposed to all the time. And we're not being exposed to the Tibetan history and the Tibetan side of the story very much. So yes, I think it's been very effective. And one aspect that also makes it effective is simply that we have been conditioned to use the language that Beijing wants us to use when we refer to Tibetans and to Tibet. So we refer to Tibet as a, as a western part of China or a region of China in the press, in the media. And people talk about Tibetans as a minority. Tibetans are not a minority, they're a people, they're an occupied people. Tibet is not a part of China. Legally speaking, it is an occupied country. It has maintained its legal independence, but is an occupied country uh, with the right to restore its independence, with the right to self-determination. And it is illegal for our governments to recognize that Tibet is part of China. Because we are not allowed under international law to recognize the annexation of territory, of a country, by force. And that is what happened. Mm -hmm. So that's what we argue in the book also. Um, and that is what we have been <coughs> also asking governments to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Michael von Walt has mentioned it, even young Tibetans um, think that Tibet has been a part of China or are not so sure about it, is it true and what can you do against it? I think that more, um, many of the younger generations uh, support Tibetan independence. Uh, uh, I, I'm not quite sure whether they really understand the history or not. I, I've always been insisting that Tibetans should pay more importance in studying Tibetan history. Uh, I have many more occasions to speak tomorrow to different groups of Tibetans, so I'll let it rest here because I think because of yesterday's uh, session, Claudia is now very strict with timing, <laughs> and uh, uh, I'll have a lot of opportunities tomorrow, so I'll give more time to Michael and Vijay to speak about it. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to, to, really to, press, to make a stressful situation here. But yes, thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, I would like to ask you, uh, Vijay, you are a journalist with international media about this narrative. Um, what is the objective? What is China's strategy with this uh, narrative? To keep the international community out of the discussion? to prepare um, to be militarily active in the region? Or what do you think? You know, one thing which I discovered uh, in Indian media and in media of the West, especially the, those who are gatekeepers of information, the Reuters, AFP, AP, BBC, CNN, Washington Post, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, New York Times, I think they have functioned more as gatekeepers of information for the world. And unfortunately, uh, since America joined hands with China, especially, you know, President Nixon and Henry Kissinger, when in 70s they, they you know, my opinion about them is that they were least informed uh, leaders of America in the history. They didn't even know the real power of uh, Soviet Union. They were so afraid of it that they went to China to make friendship, hoping that China will balance it. And within a few years, they realized that Soviet Union, you know, dropped like, uh, you know, it, it, it broke under its own weight. So they had no understanding. But in this process, the West has practically handed over everything in the hands of China. 
uh, they, they, the West gave first the respect to China which it never deserved. Uh, they brought China into the United Nations, replacing Taiwan as the real China. Then they gave all the uh, you know technology to, to China, investment to China, and finally they gave their market to China. The result is they have created a Frankenstein who is so rich now, has so much money, it is using that money against uh, the rest of the world the, and the democracy democratic system. The media, international media, is a victim of that. You will see Washington Post, New York Times and so many coming out with full uh, you know, editions sponsored by China. And their narrative also uh, is more of because they are convinced or they find profit in being, in carrying out Chinese propaganda. So the result is when these gatekeepers of information have given up and surrendered to China, it is very easy for smaller countries, smaller newspapers, smaller uh, news magazines to, to repeat the same thing. So I would, see, uh, I, I would say that it is a failure on the part of the Western media, the Western leaders and leaders of democratic world. They could not understand China and now they are on the losing side. And uh, if the nar Chinese narrative is ruling, I think now it is the responsibility of the Western media and Western leaders and Western democracies to counter it very forcefully and decisively. Yeah, you said to counter it. Um, let's talk about the situation in Switzerland. I, like, I would like to ask you, Claudia, um, how is it in Switzerland? What effect does China's narrative have here in Switzerland? Has this assertion become firmly established and accepted that um, Tibet is part of the People's Republic of China? Yeah, I think it's established this uh, meaning. I think for the Swiss government, Tibet is part of China. I notice uh, the Federal Council is committed to the One China policy and ignores the history, history of independent Tibet and the history of occupation. Switzerland, therefore, does not main maintain official relations with the Tibetan government in exile in India. But the population, I think, the population, the civil society has a different point of view. Most people in Switzerland understand Tibet as an occupied and small country fighting for its freedom. Tibet is a country with its own language, culture and religion. This identity has been systematically destroyed for many years. This is unacceptable. Tibetans have the right to linguistic, religious and cultural autonomy. Respect for human rights is paramount and Beijing's dominant assimilation strategy must be stopped. Tibet has at least, or in political uh, reality, the right to more autonomy. Uh, maybe I can see also positive changes. It's become increasingly difficult for the Swiss government to push through pro-China policy in Parliament. In any case, new agreements with China have no chance in a popular referendum. The superpower of China scares the Swiss population. This is new and an important development. Yes, you have mentioned the difference between the opinion in the parliament and the opinion in um, really among the, the people he, living here. And you have also mentioned the one China policy. Before um, we turn the focus back to Tibet and to you, um, Sekyong, I would like to ask Michael von Wald, could you explain us what is it 
this one China policy? We heard a lot, lot about it, but what is it, what is it exactly? I, what uh, uh, Claudia Friedel just said is actually quite shocking um, in terms of what she says the Swiss government's position is. First, because um, for, for Switzerland to consider Tibet to be a part of China is a violation of international law and, and civil society should, should hold the Swiss government accountable for taking a position that violates a fundamental norm of international law. Ask your government on what basis they consider Tibet to be a part of China. What is their legal argument for it? Then we can start talking. That's number one. Two, the one China policy has nothing to do with Tibet. For the Swiss government to say that somehow because they accept the one China policy, that means that they must accept that Tibet's part of China, that uh, uh, has nothing to do with it. The one China policy means accepting that there is only one China, only one government that can claim to be the government of China. This is a policy that relates only to the point that we just heard before, the fact that there are two Chinas, if you like. There is the People's Republic, there's the Republic of China. And so governments have to say, no, we don't recognize Taiwan as the Republic of China, there is only one. That is what the one China policy is about. And so it is a trick of China, and it is naive of Switzerland, to then suddenly believe that because they've had this magic idea of one, one China, that it applies to Tibet. It has nothing to do with Tibet. It does not bind the Swiss government to recognize that Tibet's part of China at all. So, thank you for the clarification. And now let's turn the focus back to Tibet. Um, Sikyong Pempa Tseling, you said in the beginning that um, one goal of your term in office was for the Chinese government to resume negotiations or, or talks with the Tibetans. On what basis do you want to resume these talks? I already answered that question. Uh, in the first statement, uh, we'll continue to uh, reach out to the Chinese government because that's the only way uh, the Tibet issue can be resolved. But we'll also continue to reach out to the international community uh, till such a lasting solution is found. We'll also be focusing on studying the reality of the situation inside Tibet. Um, and uh, right now, uh, what uh, Xi Jinping is doing to Hong Kong what Xi Jinping is doing to Uyghur uh, doesn't sound uh, like he will be in a position to resolve the Tibetan issue, but we'll have to keep trying. Mm -hmm. How could the dialogue be restarted? Through formal or informal channels? The dialogue can only be resolved through formal channels. Mm -hmm. Vichai, how do you assess the chances for negotiations? Uh, I will very respectfully disagree with Pepala. I have seen Tibet for the last 50 years. I have seen and observed the process of dialogue very closely. And unfortunately what I see, what started as His Holiness strategy to reposition Tibet in the international discourse has gone a little uh, too far and China has misused His Holiness Dalai Lama's, uh, I would say, uh, his, uh, uh, his I, I, I wanted to use the right word, His Holiness policy of uh, dialogue and the terms he has presented are very clear. He only said that he is he knows that China, Tibet has never been a part of China, Tibet has been always an independent country, but in just to ensure that the Tibetan identity survives and uh, China uh, does not continue on the path of destruction, he wants to have a dialogue. What I see 
that China has misused this position in, there is no dialogue. If you see from 2002 to 2008 or 9, the entire dialogue did not move one inch. China used this period when in 1999, European Parliament announced, passed a resolution saying that if China does not resolve the Tibetan issue by talking to Dalai Lama in next three years, we will ask our governments to recognize Dharamsala as the real government of Tibet. China ignored it for first three, you know, a quarter less than three years. And when they realized that the ultimatum is coming, the deadline is coming, they started dialogue with Dalai Lama. And they simply this was to uh, negate, to stop European Union from taking a step. Once they had done it, if they had done it, other countries would have followed the suit. So what they did, they played tricks with uh, Tibetans and Tibetans were hooked by their trick. They started dialogue from 2002 to 2008. They used this period uh, only for fortifying their position. What they did? They brought in railway line from Gormo to Lhasa. They created a situation that millions and millions of Han Tibetans can be brought into China, into Tibet. They did that. And they used this period uh, to, uh, to, to, you know, maintain their legitimacy for Olympics 2008. And it was in 2008, I was surprised why Dhanamshala was so naive that in 2008 China says, okay, okay, we are having dialogue, please tell us what do you want. You know, China has used this period to bring in millions of Hans into Tibet. China has used to uh, expand its military clutch over Tibet. And Dhanamshala did not achieve one inch out of it. So I have my doubts. I have no doubts about the capabilities of His Holiness Dalai Lama. I have no doubts about the uh, capabilities of the CTA. But I am very much sure the intentions, black intentions of China. They have deceived you all these years in the name of dialogue. They will do it again. So I don't think uh, dialogue is going to work. But that is my opinion. Oh, my friends are free to disagree with me. But I agree with Papa Tsarinda when he says that we should approach the international community. I think you should put all your forces, all your power, all your energies in reaching out to the world community, world governments, world parliaments, and uh, force your the question of Tibet uh, in the way you have been. You depict a pessimistic picture based on the experience in the past. I would like to ask you, Michael von Bolt, how do you assess the chances in the future? I, I can't see into the future. Uh, but the one thing I think that we can be certain of, I can predict this, is that everything changes. And so, just as other empires have fallen and other colonial powers have had to let go their colonies, this will happen as well. The question is really only when. You know, nobody believed that the Baltic states would ever be independent again. Nobody believed that East Timor, a small island with 600,000 people, could become independent from this enormous country, Indonesia. The asymmetry is the same between Tibet and, and China. A huge power and a very small country. Not small in surface area, but in population relatively. Um, changes happen. They don't necessarily happen in the way we expect them to happen. It can be natural disasters. It can be economic crisis. It can be uh, over, overreaching of China in its Belt and Road Initiative. It can be a number of things. But change will happen, and our task is really 
to make sure that when that happens, that Tibet is intact, that the Tibetan identity is there, that the movement is alive, that it knows what it has to do, that the international community knows what its responsibilities are, they don't today, and therefore that when that opportunity arises, the opportunity is always extremely short. When the opportunity arises, that everybody does what they're supposed to do and takes that opportunity for change, and that change can then happen. Thank you for this um, hopeful perspective. You mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative, this gigantic um, project, um, China's project with land and sea transport route. I would like to ask you, Rolf, um, what are the Chinese objectives of this gigantic project? Um, I think that first it's a kind of um, economic development for the Chinese companies. It doesn't have to do anything with the countries which uh, are just included in this road belt. Because if we see what the investments are going there, 80% are about Chinese and not by the, the national companies. I can tell a little story when I was in, in Ghana 10 years ago. My father worked there when he was young as an architect. So we tried to, to uh, take some roots of him there. And everywhere we, we saw Chinese companies constructing roads and houses. It was the same type of houses you find in Taiwan and China. So I think um, this Road and Belt Initiative is now under stress. I think also that the pandemic <coughs> who outbreak in Wuhan last year, the matter how the Chinese government handled it, for me, it was the biggest mistake they did the last 30 years, because they don't want to realize they have to take the, the um, con con not control, but to, to analyze this and they block everything. For me also there are some signs there, signs there are changes because you see now there was the, the 20 um, um, G in, in, in Rome, Xi Jinping was not there. And I discussed with my wife, I think it's not only because he has fear to confront now the critics in the West and other countries, but I think also that there is some uh, tensions in China itself. And I think he, he doesn't want to leave the country because he doesn't know uh, how is the situation when he gets back. Do you agree, Do you agree with this, Michael? I think, uh, as uh, Sikyong has also said in a number of occasions during his, uh, his trip, uh, there is uh, some evidence of there being a lot of insecurity uh, among in the Chinese leadership or Xi Jinping um, uh, in terms of the Communist Party's control uh, being secure. And this is an example of that. Uh, of course, uh, Xi Jinping did not also participate in the climate change conference, um, another sign. But also, and this I think is, is important uh, uh, as well, is that the very assertive and aggressive at times policies of China in northern India, in Arunachal Pradesh and elsewhere on the border, in the South China Sea, uh, uh, towards Taiwan, all these things are also created in order to prepare for a possible diversion if there's an internal problem in China, if the Communist Party is under threat in China itself, then having some type of conflict outside is going to enable the leadership to get everybody united again for the, for the party, for the leadership. And that's a very dangerous situation at the moment. And I would like to ask you, Sekyon Penpaseri, one of the criticisms of the Belt and Road Initiative is that the People's Republic of China has been accused of creating economic dependencies 
in order to be able to deflect criticism of human rights abuses. Do you agree with this? Uh, before we go there, I just want to make the statement that every nation, every nation, for every nation, their national interest comes first. I hope India comes to our rescue. And the reality is also that the solution to Tibet can come only from China. America cannot grant that to us. Well, it's true with regard to this question, it's true. There are dead economies from Sri Lanka to Pakistan to many other countries where Sri Lanka had to part with an island to give it to China because they are not able to pay debt. With Pakistan, with the takeover of Gwadar port and the building of Karakoram, 60 billion to now 40 billion, Pakistan is under debt. Even if they call their relations sweeter than honey, deeper than sea, higher than mountains, whatever sense they call it, countries are under debt and people are realizing that. I hope the European Union also wakes up to the reality because there is a changing dynamic. I think so far in Switzerland, um, the opinion has changed a little bit. You mentioned it, um, Claudia Friedel. I think we hear more critical voices in Switzerland. There has been criticism of partnerships, for example, between Swiss and Chinese cities, or criticism um, of a project such as the China Garden in Zurich. Has there been a shift in the opinion here in Switzerland? Oh. <coughs> I, yeah, it could be, it could be. I, I think in the society, in the civil society, it is like this, but in the official, I mean, in the government, on in the government, I'm not sure that we are really on this way, because when we see the Belt and Road Initiative, Switzerland was the one of the first countries to sign the memorandum, a memorandum of understanding, uh, on. Uh, at, and at the beginning, the Swiss government demanded a commitment to human rights and the protection of ethnic minorities, but without success. But then, they nevertheless, our ministers signed the memorandum that underpins technical economic, economic cooperation between the two countries. So here I can't see really a progress in this direction. But we from the group, we have uh, an initiative, we demand from the government that it always and in, in all areas conducts the bilateral human rights dialogue and strengthen human rights competencies in the foreign representations in China, in our own foreign uh, representation. So there is a need to know more about uh, China. The competence have to be uh, arise. In addition, we call on the government to modernize the existing uh, uh, free trade agreement and to include a binding chapter on the observance of human rights and labor rights and minority protection. So I think the government is now under pressure to do something because the civil society is not willing to, to do uh, these things or to accept this going any longer. You mentioned the situation in Switzerland. Um, various states are um, affected by the Belt and Road initiatives, from Pakistan to Sri Lanka, Kazakhstan, Greece, parts of Africa. How do these different regions of the world react? Or how was there also a shift of opinion there? I don't know, Richard, if you can say something about this. 
Uh, yes, there is a change now. Initially, this Belt and Road Initiative started as a strategy of China. And this strategy was very interesting. China, because of, if I can use the word, uh, foolishness of the West. China minted money, trillions and trillions of dollars on the strength of Western technology, on the strength of uh, uh, Western business, on the strength of manufacturing, on behalf of the West, and on the strength of providing, West providing its own, itself as a market to China. China made trillions of dollars. And they reinvested it to sabotage the West, to sabotage democracy. This Belt and Road Initiative is uh, in that sense. What they have done is in Africa, in countries around, around my country, India, in Pakistan, in uh, Sri Lanka, in uh, Mali, in uh, Djibouti, they have invested tons and tons of money to create infrastructure which is of use to China. They created a uh, port, uh, naval ports for Pakistan, naval port for Sri Lanka. And those ports where Pakistanis need Chinese visa to enter Gwadar. In Colombo there is a published passport of those who can enter Colombo's that port. Djibouti is the same position. So, uh, Malay is there, Chittagong of uh, Bangladesh is there, uh, uh, then Cocoa Islands of uh, uh, Burma is there. So China invested money in these projects which were of use to China to uh, capture market, world market and it gave money to these countries as loan. So now what I see as a hope. China has invested trillions of dollars in those countries which cannot pay. So now it is not the West who will fight China. It is these poor countries who will fight China. Because China earlier gave them money, bought their votes in United Nations. WHO is occupied by China. United Nations, <laughs> you know, all agencies are occupied by China. Because they, it got votes from those poor countries, those corrupt leaders of those countries whom, where they invested money. So now that money is falling apart. That money investment is failing. Now China will lose that money. If West now decides to hit back and stop providing itself as market to China, then you will see tons of industries in China will stop, will fail. And what my friend Michael Van Ward says from what will happen within, then you will see, you know, hundreds of thousands of companies of China could closing down. Millions and millions of those Chinese who have now are got used to not Mao's lifestyle, used to Deng Xiaoping's lifestyle, who want to be rich, who say uh, it's a it's a it's a virtue to be rich. Now those Chinese who want to be rich, want to be prosperous, want to have all comforts. When Xi Jinping fails in it, they will throw him out. They will throw the Communist Party of China. The West should wake up. This is the right moment to hit back. Uh, one of the criticisms against the Belt and Road Initiative is, all, is also um, that it doesn't transport not only goods, but also narratives. Also, uh, it influences the public opinion. Um, Rolf, what is your perspective on this? How does the Chinese, how do the Chinese narratives arrive in Europe? Uh, I think it's a very, very important point because um, Richai and Michael told it and said it, the Chinese narrative is dominating our discussion. And I think we here as Swiss people, Swiss citizens, we should be aware of that. Uh, personally, I'm writing a book now just to counter this narrative. Uh, the title will be SOS Democracy, how the totalitarian politics of Pe Beijing, Peking, is threatening our liberty. Uh, let me tell one little example. When Xi Jinping is speaking to the outside world, to the West and other countries, 
he is also spe uh, always speaking uh, about globalization, about bilateral trade and um, international community. But when the, the Chinese Communist Party is talking about the West, uh, they have another, a different, very different narrative. They always call the West hostile Western forces, feindliche westliche Kräfte. That means our democracies are the enemy of the Chinese Communist regime. So for me it's very important that we don't believe what the Chinese Communists tell us. We cannot believe what they are just um, saying, what they are doing, because it's all of them, for me, most of them are lies. And I think it's very important that we come to now this narrative, just as Michael does it about Tibet, and that we all, all of the, the, the European uh, people uh, are aware that we have to block, and how, uh, which I said, we have, really have to counterattack. We don't have to, to um, hear and, and um, the, to, to weigh them. Uh, another, little, another little example, when Li Keqiang, he is the second uh, after Xi Jinping, went to Switzerland a few years ago, I live in Embrach, just uh, they, they, the, the, the Swiss government arranged that um, Li Keqiang was transported from the airport to a farm in Embrach to see some Swiss farm lines. Even our nature of the city wasn't deformed. All of the street was blocked by the police. And I think if we are treating, uh, treating China like this, we are just uh, obeying them. We should counterattack attack them. And, and I think also it's the time now because the, the pandemic opened a lot of people the eyes. I read um, a statistic about Germany that now 70% of the Germans they don't like the Chinese government. If you look five years ago, I think it was just the opposite. Thank you, Rolf. Uh, you in the audience, you will have the possibility to ask your questions in about five or ten minutes. But now I would like to talk about the situation of the Tibetans in Switzerland. Um, for a while, Tibetans without passports or other formal papers had to resolve all their administrative matters directly at the Chinese embassy. Is that still the case, Claudia? Do they have to go to the embassy? I think you can ask the people here in the, in the room. They know it better than me, I think. But uh, for, I, I think it's all, all, uh, still like this. It's still, it's, it's, yes. it's the same for Taiwanese people, I think, Wolf? When my wife lived in, when we married, uh, she got a Swiss passport and there was written Taipei, Taiwan. Three years ago, after the negotiations uh, of the Swiss government, for the tree, uh, free trading agreement, now she got a new passport and there is written Taipei China. It explains all. Everything. Um, what do the Tibetans, Rolf, I don't know if, if you know it or if or you, Claudia, I'm not sure. What do the Tibetans experience there at the embassy? Or probably I should give a microphone into the audience, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's better because I never was on the, uh, there, so maybe it's better that somebody else will I don't answer. know if... Is there someone raising a hand and would... Yeah, I will bring you the microphone over and hold it for you. Uh, I know a little bit of the case, and uh, we have the same here, no? uh, the migration office, and they uh, insist that the people in Japan who are seeking for asylum uh, should uh, approach the Chinese embassy. And uh, I know so far that when they go there, the Chinese embassy doesn't address their issues or their problems. 
so they get rejected. And we also have uh, witnesses, Swiss people who have accompanied uh, the Tibetans going there to China's embassy. And uh, that's a fact. So uh, there's a big collaboration between the Swiss government through the same with the Chinese government. And I think that's the fact because uh, through the whole uh, uh, asylum process, uh, there are Chinese, uh, from the Chinese government, uh, organized uh, translators or whatever, who uh, get all uh, get access to all those documents of Japan refugees who are seeking asylum in Switzerland. And I would just like to make a small remarks. We shouldn't forget that the Chinese, that the Swiss government, uh, 60 years before. They granted Japan's as political asylum. Japan's came as political refugees to Switzerland, and that goes for God. And today's Swiss government, they are just doing the opposite. They are contradicting their own Swiss government of those times, 60 years ago. And I, I, would just, I just wanted to make a small remark because it was important to, uh, to let the Swiss people know that Japan's have been. Uh, have been granted political asylum 60 years before. That means Tibet was, in fact, an independent country. Otherwise, they wouldn't have uh, granted us Tibetan as Tibetan refugees. They would have called us Chinese refugees, and that was not the case. Thank you. Thank you for this statement. I think there is another statement. Can you give? I don't know if, if you want to. Bring the microphone over. Yep. I think there's been another statement, yes. Oh, okay. I can just tell from my experience in Austria, we have the same problem, yeah? That they were asking the Tibetan refugees to go to the Chinese embassy, and we protested against this with the support of the Green Party and the Human Rights Center in Vienna. And uh, we got the support from them as far as we, uh, we didn't need to do, go anymore to the Chinese embassy because it wasn't acceptable since we are our, uh, the Tibetans were refugees from because of the oppression of China. So it uh, was not logic that we had to go to the Chinese embassy just to make documents for us. And uh, it was possible that we had a protest also, which was called I, I am Tibetan. And many Austrians came with the party <coughs> saying, I am also a Tibetan. And fighting for the same rights, for our rights, actually. And since then, we, uh, no, no Tibetan had to go to the Chinese embassy for any documents anymore. Okay, okay. Thank you for this statement. Um, I would like to ask you, Claudia, Oh, is there another one? I don't, I don't yeah. want to yeah. forget. Uh, Chetanya, you have some experience yeah. about your children. Mm -hmm. uh, my English is not good. I will speak to them. <laughs> so maybe they can translate. Uh, I have a, I'll try. I have the same problem. In my uh, family, we have a, a, a visa problem. It's already happened because uh, when my son is uh, uh, going to uh, China to learn uh, uh, what say? Mm, with the school group. for the school, yeah, and they didn't only, keep. Only. There is a 23 students, but only my son visa at the passes they take take and. Uh, but in the Swiss, we are uh, very uh, common to ask why. So the Ch uh, Chinese embassy says there is no reason. It's uh, uh, accidentally. And then same same happened with my wife. She is going to uh, uh, business. Uh, what we say? Uh, trip, yeah. But uh, even they stopped my wife. No reason, because I'm Tibetan. So that, that was a case happened today. So 
we went to uh, uh, Swiss uh, foreign, yeah, Embassy? foreign department. So they they have done something, but nothing result. So that's uh, what happens today. They are bully us. We are officially Swiss people. We are Swiss citizen. But even the Chinese embassy doing a bully with us. So that's the what's today happening. But we will never give up. We are fighting again and again. So thank you for these um, impressive statements. I would like to ask you, Claudia, um, um, are there efforts to change this? Um, in Switzerland, are there parliamentary initiatives on the way, or um, is the Tibetan parliamentary group active in this? I uh, give you mine. Yes, thank you for this question. Yes, we heard about all these cases, and so we really want to do something. But it started with the. Uh, with the change in origin from Tibet to China in the in the past in the papers in the passports, and uh, I think that was uh, hardly to believe that is only an administrative act how it called it. So um, we heard also about this uh, difficulty difficulty for Tibetans in Switzerland to obtain travel documents. Uh, Tibetans whose applications for travel documents are refused or rejected by the Chinese authorities, like you have explained it. And uh, so we have uh, introduced some... Yeah. Yeah, we try to do something, but we are not successfully in the moment with our with our uh, work. Okay, thank you for this statement also. Now um, we have heard a lot of information from our guests, but you in the audience, you still have the opportunity to ask questions um, directly to the panel. I think Thomas, can you bring another microphone if um, who raises his um, or her hand uh, will be able to make a statement. Um, you please direct your question to a specific <laughs> to a specific panel member uh, so they can respond to your questions. Ich bin seit 1964 bei der Schweiz und bis jetzt, das ist nicht bis jetzt früher, bin ich anerkannt worden als Tibeter auf dem Papier und das ist heutzutage nicht mehr möglich. Und, wir kommen, und wenn Sie mir sagen, wir sind ein paar von Chinesen, das ist die Pflicht. Und ich habe momentan das Gefühl, wir müssen nur Geduld hier im Land. Ich weiß, hat mir viel geholfen. Ich bin da aufgewachsen, bin mit besten Leuten da aufgewachsen. Früher war kein Problem, man kann sagen, ich bin ein Tibeter. Heutzutage durch den Computer und das ganze Zeug sagen, Tibet existiert gar nicht. Und wir können zu mir sagen, wir sind ein paar von China. Viele Tibeter sind aus der Lande hier. Die haben kein Papier. Ich habe auch keinen Schützerpass. Nie werde ich beantragen. Weil das ist nur nicht stolz. Und Tibet. Ich kann nicht mein Land beleuchten. Tibeter sind auf der ganzen Welt verteilt. Nur Geduld und Kurs. Wie sieht es jetzt aus? The Chinese influence and surveillance of Tibetan diaspora in Switzerland is increasing 
That's uh, also confirmed by the Federal Intelligence Service. That's really uh, uh, but, uh, not a good, uh, it's not a good um, sign for us. So, uh, Tibetans in Switzerland are therefore increasingly suffering from the Chinese repression. <coughs> That's true. For me, it is clear that we cannot accept this in an independent and sovereign country. The Swiss government must protect the fundamental rights of Tibetans in Switzerland, and we have to do it to help to do that. We have another question over there. Oh. Thank you very much. I have a question and it's very difficult for me to address it to one specific speaker. So I'd like to leave it open. Either of you can answer this question. Uh, we heard now a lot about uh, the soft power approach of the CCP. Uh, just like Confucius once said that he's not going for an all-in war. So he's just trying to take parts and parts and parts of it. And uh, you also talked about the Belt and Road Initiative. So nowadays, just like Sidio Pembertrinda mentioned, countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Djibouti, etc. are realizing that they have to default all the loans that they took from the CCP, that they are not able to pay back all the costs of the infrastructure project Belt and Road Initiatives, and that slowly even those corrupt governments are realizing that this game, this project, this, um, this quest with China is not working. And even we in Switzerland have, um, have um, observed that the free trade agreement between Switzerland and China that has been ratified in 2015 is not working. So part of the Swiss industry is already complaining and objecting that the mutual benefit of free trade agreement with um, not paying any more import tax, etc., is only working for the Swiss and uh, for the Chinese investments in, into Switzerland with Chinese. And exports into Switzerland, but not on this, uh, vice versa, uh, when Swiss companies are realizing that the Chinese are deceiving the, the industry, all the, the chain of commerce, the politicians, etc. And uh, as you mentioned, that also the, even members of the Swiss parliament are now more and more objective to uh, pro-China uh, policies into the parliament. And um, what we would like to know is that we have tried the dialogue, the direct dialogue between the, the, the Central Tibet Administration and the Chinese government. And as we can see, uh, the results are really, uh, I would say, not really as, as, astonishing. And um, the thing is, like, with um, Mr. Van Wald, you are advisor of the uh, Central Tibet Administration, and in your position as an advisor, what is it? that Tibetan uh, government bodies and non-governmental organizations can do and focus on rather than to uh, hoping on the dialogue between China and the CTA. Um, when you also observe that countries like Lithuania or um, also the, the, the alliances that has been built with Tibetans, Taiwanese, Hong Kongers, Uyghurs, like that we have seen in 10 years before, is there another approach that, if you could speak free or frank on your mind, that you would uh, propose? And uh, maybe also for Sidon Pimpertrinda, um, that um, you have already experienced that other broader alliances have been formed against China uh, with the help of the President uh, Tsai Ing-wen, for example. Like she's a really, uh, I don't know how to say it, but she has also, I think, under her, under, under her rulership, the uh, Tibetan pro-democracy movement have flourished in Taiwan. Is there another approach that maybe the CTA can take further to strengthen relationships with countries like them? Thank you very much. Okay, so first you, Michael. Okay. <clears throat> 
I don't think it's a question of an, another of one approach or another. I think there's a number of things that need to be done, and civil society has has a very important role to play. Um, so as you might guess from what I've said so far, um, I believe it is extremely important to really, at this particular juncture, to really uh, concentrate on um, countering the Chinese narratives, uh, on <clears throat> establishing uh, or re-establishing the truth of uh, the Sino-Tibetan conflict, what it's about. Um, as I said, you know, many years ago it was clear, it isn't anymore, so it is our duty to make it clear again. That's, that, I think, is, is very important, in other words, to, but also to hold uh, your government, your parliamentarians, uh, international organizations accountable for their actions. I mean, the, what was just said about refugees having to go to the country that is persecuting them to, to get their papers in order, this is so absurd and such a violation of basic refugee law that I can't imagine that that's really happening in Switzerland. And if it is, it really needs to be addressed. And otherwise, I think you should even, uh, I mean, you know, we should go to court uh, about something like that. Um, but also, uh, again, simply making clear that, as, as this gentleman uh, did here, really making a good case for the fact that Tibet exists, that it has rights, not, you know, the Tibetan issue is not a human rights issue. Yes, there are human rights violations. Yes, they need to be addressed. Tibet is not a minority issue. It is an international conflict, and Switzerland, above any other country, with its reputation for resolving and mediating in international conflicts, and its reputation that it has, has a responsibility to help resolve this conflict. What it is doing today is the opposite. It can say that it supports negotiated solution, but by acting as if Tibet is part of China, and by, by re recognizing Tibet as part of China in all the ways that we've discussed, it is actually taking away the only incentive that the PRC leadership has to talk with the Tibetans, which is to get legitimacy from the Tibetans, from His Holiness, for their presence in Tibet. If they no longer need that because Switzerland and the United States and the Netherlands, my country and others are saying, oh yes, Tibet's part of China, you have sovereignty in Tibet, then there is no reason for them anymore to seek legitimacy from Tibetans. So I think this argument needs to be made with the Swiss authorities. You know, even to call Tibetans and the, the, the proposal to try to get some, some provisions for minority protections, it's racist. We don't talk about the Scottish people as a minority. We don't talk about the Basques as a minority. Why do we talk about the Tibetans as a minority? Because they're Asians, because we don't know the difference between Tibetans and, and Uyghurs and Mongols and Chinese. So they must be a minority. This is not acceptable. Tibetans are a people under international law, and the rights of a people is very different from the rights of minorities. China knows this. This is why China wants us to use the word ethnic minority, religious minority, etc. And we're doing it. We're pleasing them. We need to change this kind of language. Also among ourselves, we need to be careful about how we, how we speak. Um, last five days, I was in Switzerland. And I was trying to understand Swiss politics that I've been away for so long. Um, it's quite appalling uh, to understand the reality of the Swiss politics today and their position on Tibet. And I've been quite blunt, even to the United States, United Nations, I told them, the people at the Helm of Affairs, I told them very clearly, we find United Nations as the most undemocratic institution in the world. 
we find United Nations as the most unequal power in the world. 193 countries, five countries have veto power. Whatever you discuss at the General Assembly level, when it reaches the Security Council, goes nowhere. And we have no space to speak our mind. That is why we organize this two days Geneva Forum. And at every given opportunity, we have to piggyback on non-governmental organizations to raise our voice. And this is beautiful, humiliating. And people who oppress are sitting as judges on the high table and decide for us. So there is no space in the international community for us to speak. With regards to Swiss, is, I think the, our friend here who raised this issue, Swiss government received Tibetans as early as 1961. And they received Tibetans as refugees. And I impressed on your relevant authorities yesterday that you are anyway giving I have not seen the, the Swiss government, they, they still don't have the courage to deport Tibetans back to China or India. You are anyway granting asylum in two years, three years, four years, five years. So why don't you do it now? At least the Tibetans will feel that the Swiss government has been kind to us. You suffer for two, three, four, five years and you feel that you struggled a lot to get this paper. It's a very simple argument. And I also told them that I'm completely appalled at the extradition treaty that Swiss government signed with the Chinese government. Do you have a Swiss criminal who ran away to China and needs to be extradited back to Switzerland? It's only for China's benefit that they are, they are signing this extradition treaty. It's very plain, very simple. It's very clear that the business community is winning. Swiss is rich, but the business people still want more money. But money alone doesn't bring happiness. <coughs> and you sacrifice the values that you cherish here as a free country with all human rights, with human dignity. And I've been blunt, very, very blunt with your government. And I've also appealed to the members of the interparliamentary group to raise their voice, but the numbers are not enough right now. But there is growing awareness. You have the Swiss author who wrote about United Work Front's intrusion into your financial institutions, in your media houses, in the universities. It's quite appalling to see this sea change because Everybody is. The United States has gone through this in the last 20 years. We also expected that the China, China will become more responsible global uh, power if they become part of the global uh, political system. His Holiness also supported uh, China's entry into WTO. His Holiness supported China organizing 2008 Olympics. But now everybody realizes that what we thought could be achieved is not being achieved. And today Switzerland is going in the opposite direction of what the world is doing. And I hope it's not too, not, not too late for the Swiss politicians and the Swiss business people to understand the reality of this situation. Me had one point, very quick point. Then, <coughs> then. Uh, Today I met a friend, a Tibetan friend living in Switzerland and I was shocked to see, uh, to hear about one case. His child, who is a Swiss national, who has a Swiss passport, student of a school, the school is sending about 20 or 25 students, Swiss students to China for a study tour. And the Chinese embassy rejects visa for one child who is holding a Swiss passport because his name is Tenzin. To here, I don't think it is an insult to Tibetans. 
I look at it as an insert by Chinese embassy to the identity of Switzerland, to the passport of Switzerland, to the government of Switzerland, to the sovereignty of Switzerland. And I, as an Indian who cherish democracy, who cherish our own national respect, uh, and we respect Switzerland so much for so many good reasons. We wish the Switzerland government, the Switzerland government should, uh, system should wake up that they are being insulted by the Chinese embassy. This is not the question of rights of a school child who belongs to, a, who was born in a Tibetan family. This is the case of a Swiss national child who is being rejected, visa on the ground, he, his name is Tenzin, as if Chinese government will decide what the Tibet, Swiss parents, how they will name their children. I think Swiss government should stand up for its own self-respect, leave aside the Tibetan issue. Thank you, Richard. Our time has disappeared. I'm really sorry, but I would like to thank our guest panelists on the stage for their thought-provoking perspectives, their input and expertise. I think um, there is more space for um, direct questions after we close this evening. Thank you in the audience for your interest and your questions. I wish you a nice evening and a safe trip home and thank my guests on the panel. In my opening statement, I mentioned that we expect the official Switzerland would adjust its view on the PRC towards reality and that we would come to know more about this reality today. I think the speakers have fulfilled completely our expectations. With your uh, signaled uh, applause, it was, I think you agreed with my statement. So, they did an impressive job today, and already yesterday, of course. We have learned many background uh, reasons why Tibet is not part of China. So, in our organizations, I think, we'll strongly <coughs> say in future, yes, to Tibet. Thank you. So, uh, some uh, notes about uh, when you go out. At the exit door, or outside the exit door, here you will find a table with the book of Michael and uh, very impressive, exclusive, exclusive artistic, artistic photos taken by our Vijay Kranti of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama in the 80s in Namsar and in Zanskar. You also will find our Tibet Focus magazine. Uh, the last edition has the interview with And of course, another uh, point near the exit door, there is there are uh, two donation boxes, quite a big one. One of it. <laughs> it's uh, very nice if you would make them very happy by filling them up. And you can be sure the money will be used for our common Tibet cause. Now, we'll hand over the traditional Tibetan kathas to the panelists along with the uh, present, for which all of them had to work hard 
uh, most of them in two rounds yesterday in Bayern, Bern and today in Zurich. So uh, I hope they will they will um, enjoy the small presents also which we hand over to them. Tenzulogutevinan, and you begin to get honest with the girl, because you know she never formed some sort of shape to his shoulder to stay in contact with the case. I need to go to my own guy. I think I can't do it. I'm not sure. 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 I'm not Ma te avevi in me, carisci, ti vuoi niente, ero qua. Ti dico, non è una nascita, non è una nascita. 